Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving over the 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM's members. Uh, I'm Eric Meyer. I'm currently the CEO of Applied Duality, which I founded in 2013. And in the past, I headed the cloud programmability team at Microsoft where I worked on little things like C Sharp, Visual Basic, Link, Volta, and the reactive framework, Rx. Um, my research has included areas of functional programming, parsing, language design, XML, etc. I'm also teaching at the Delft University of Technology, um, where currently I'm running a MOOC on functional programming on edX. Um, and I'm a member of the ACMQ editorial board, and we are always happy to um, receive papers from you for this. Sorry, my mouse is gone. Uh, okay. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that foster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM learning resources at acmlearningcenter.org. Um, you can see some of the highlights uh, on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. For example, ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM. Um, for example, the communications of the ACM and the Q magazines, access to the ACM digital library, the most comprehensive database of computing literature, um, and I couldn't live without that. Um, it organizes many international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics. And last but not least, uh, ACM supports education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, and it gives away the ACM Turing and Infosys Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technologies that enrich our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, there's a few housekeeping items and you can see them in the slide in front of you. Um, on the top right of the slide area, there's a button that will allow you to um, enlarge the slides. That's kind of you know, obvious, the same button that's kind of you know, in any uh, situation to enlarge the windows. You don't have to do anything to advance the slides. Uh, they will um, automatically go throughout the event. And uh, I can assure you not as kind of you know, um, slow as I do it by hand now. Um, you can also minimize the slide area. Um, and there's also kind of a lot of widgets on the bottom panel that you can see. Um, this is probably the most important one. If you have problems with the web interface, um, just hit the F5 keys on Windows or Command R on a Mac. Um, and on a, a mobile browser, you can, you, know, you refresh your um, display by close and relaunch the application. And there's, of course, the help button um, to uh, find more information. To control the volume, you have to kind of use your own computer volume button. And then at the end of the presentation, we will have time for questions, and we hope there will be many questions. Uh, there's a question box where you can type in your question, and then um, we will answer them on the fly, or maybe if they're kind of really good questions, we'll interrupt the speaker. And then at the end of the presentation, don't forget to fill in the survey. Um, of course, the session is recorded and will be ar archived and you will receive an email notification when it's available, or you can check the learning.acm.org um, sites. You can also follow us on uh, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, 
um, using the widgets that are um, in the um, bottom panel, and then you can share the presentation link with your friends and colleagues as you tweet. And uh, you can use the hashtag, hash ACM webinar EF from Entity Framework. So that brings us to today's presentation, uh, data access and entity framework. That's why the um, hashtag has EF at the end, because the entity framework is often called EF. And our speaker is Terry uh, Cotta. Terry is currently the CTO for Marine Learning Systems. Marine Learning Systems is an e-learning software and services provider to the maritime and resource industry. Maritime means ships and all those kind of things, if you, you know, don't know what it means. And prior to Marine Learning System, Terry was the president of Associcom, a Vancouver-based startup that builds online communities for professional and trade associations. His expertise is in the areas of software architecture and software development. Um, as the CTO for Vitrium Systems, he led the development organization through the release of three new products and expanded the customer base from 10 to over 200. In 2001, to, from 2001 to 2005, he was the VP of development at Silicon Chalk, where he led a team developing a unique real-time collaboration tool for use at universities and colleges. Terry was also a founding partner in Network Software Group, acquired by Open Text Corporation in 1996, and director of software development um, at GPS Industries, Inc. So he is a, a serial entrepreneur um, and a great hacker. And he is, of course, also a very active ACM volunteer. He serves on the ACM practitioner boards and on the ACMQ um, editorial board and he chairs the case study committee. Terry, we look very much forward to your presentation here today. So um, go ahead, Terry, um, yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, You're welcome. That was a, a, a lovely introduction. Uh, we're, we are super lucky actually to have Eric moderating today because later in uh, the slides, we'll see that one of the things that we uh, talk about in Entity Framework is LINK, the Language Integrated Query Framework, and of course Eric is actually the person that wrote that, so we've uh, really got a, a, an excellent source of expertise on that uh, for some of your questions later on. So uh, what am I going to do today? Um, well, the first thing I'm going to try and address is um, when is it appropriate to actually use something like Entity Framework? Because um, the computing landscape has changed a lot. You know, really you know, over the entire lifetime of probably everybody involved, but really uh, particularly over the past five years, we've seen an explosion in the amount of data that one processes and the types of applications that one is building. Um, and Entity Framework is actually not appropriate for all of these things. So first thing we have to do is try and identify where does it make sense to use this. Um, so that's kind of the first part of the talk. Second part of the talk is actually looking at some best practices for using Entity Framework. And these come out of um, just my personal experience in having delivered a couple of applications built on top of Entity Framework. Uh, so um, I am not a kind of a researcher expert. I'm a guy who uses these tools to get software products out the door. And that's kind of where my expertise comes from. And so, um, if you have best practices that you think I've missed or best practices where you think I'm actually making a mistake, those are probably interesting things to talk about because, as I say, they derive uh, from my personal experience in the way that I'm using these tools for the products that I have to deliver. And uh, it's actually, some of you may have, may have other experiences. Okay. So uh, the first thing is actually I want to talk about what's uh, an object relational manager. Now, most of you signed up to this webinar because it had the word Entity Framework in it, so you probably know what an ORM is. But just in case, I'm going to do a little bit of a background here. So everybody who knows what an ORM is can leave the room, except for me. I know what an ORM is, but I have to stay here and explain it to you. So um, the idea with an, an ORM uh, and I guess I should say, so Entity Framework is a class of software that people refer to as ORMs. An ORM is an, short for an Object Relational Manager. And what does an Object Relational Manager do? Well, basically, it's the thing that deals with 
taking data out of the database, which comes in nice little rows, and getting it into objects inside your system, which is what most programmers are familiar with. So on the slide here, you can see I've taken a little screenshot of a piece of SQL Management Studio where I've got some data about users. And then at the bottom, I've got a, a class where we could represent that information. And you can see that you know, there's a, a column in the database called ID, and it's a GUID. And in the corresponding object that I've built up, there is a public field called GUID. And so you can see how um, the information from this row in the database can map very nicely into this object. And so you could obviously and many of you probably have built software that does this yourself. You issue queries on the database and you fill in these objects. Now an example like this is very straightforward because basically all we're doing is just pulling the values out of those columns and sticking them into the database. Where it gets more interesting and the reason why people build object relational managers is when you start to consider foreign key relationships, inheritance and that type of thing because now there become more complicated questions about how you pull um, the data in from the database. For example, if this table included a foreign key to a series of entries in another table, how would you represent that in an object? And when you pulled that information back from the database, how would you pull it back? Um, the most natural representation of something like that is that foreign key is going to come back as a collection of some other type of objects. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward. But suppose that the number of entries in that collection is 10, or 100, or 1,000, or 10,000. Should you always go and pull all of those objects in when you want to read this parent object that's associated with them? And that's the kind of question that an ORM is helping you deal with. It's software to help you deal with that process of pulling data in from the database, making it looking like objects, allowing you to make some changes, and then sending that data back out again, storing that data back into the database. Um, so, as I said, Entity Framework is a class, uh, or a, a, an example of this class of software of ORMs, and of course there are other ones available. Probably the most popular um, are Hibernate, which is for Java, and Hibernate, which started out as a port of Hibernate, as its name suggests, which is usable uh, with C Sharp and Windows. And of course, Entity Framework, which we're going to be talking about today. But there are lots of these out there. There are tons and tons of ORMs. Um, many, what's interesting is many people in the process of building an application often end up building something that looks like an ORM, because of course, data access is a fundamental part of pretty much any application that we're going to write. I've also included on this slide a couple of uh, links to places where the, you can get information um, about some of these things. Um, again, there's a lot of information out on the net, so really there are a whole bunch of places where you could go and look up information about ORMs in general and about specific ORMs. Uh, the last link is one that I find uh, pretty useful. Uh, it is from a person who works on the Entity Framework team, and he has a really good series of blog posts that talk about how some of the internal components of Entity Framework function. Okay, so that's it for talking about ORMs. Now we're going to go back to that first part of the talk, uh, which is to say, when does it make sense to use something like Entity Framework? Well, Entity Framework, first of all, is uh, essentially always coupled with SQL Server. So really it's a pair of things. You've got Entity Framework as the ORM and SQL Server as the underlying data store. Uh, and so when you're asking the question about when is it appropriate to use Entity Framework, you are in a sense simultaneously asking the question of when is it appropriate to use a SQL data store. And the things that you have to think about are uh, the volume of data, the rate at which that data is arriving. Um, the nature of the way that you store information, for example, do you just write information into the database and then never update it? Um, or is this information that's going to be updated on a, a relatively frequent basis? Um, there's a question of structure. Um, how, when you're pulling in information, when you're getting this information, uh, 
how does it relate to itself? I mean, uh, we'll look at this a little bit more detail in one of the other slides, but it's basically you, you might have users, and users might refer to lists of papers that they've published. So that's a type of a relation that connects different types of information. Another really important thing is consistency requirements. Um, we'll talk about this later on, but I mean, a lot of you have probably heard about um, eventual consistency. Uh, and so there is this notion of, you know, when you're processing this data, what assumptions can you make about how up to date it is? Um, we've got scaling requirements and also interestingly, I think um, time to market considerations, which is to say, when is using something like Entity Framework going to allow you to deliver software faster? So, Entity Framework can be applied in a variety of circumstances, but the place where it probably makes most sense is a situation where you've got data that has significant relational structure, and I've got an example to point out um, what this means. Where you've got strong consistency that's needed, and we'll talk about that in the context of the um, example as well, where the arrival rate for the data is, I would say, low to moderate. Um, if you have a fire hose of data coming into you, like you know the fire hose from Twitter example from their API, um, it's hard to get something like SQL Server to um, accept that data that quickly, and so you start to look to other types of data sources when you're dealing with extremely high volumes of data. Um, also, I mean, you may be dealing with data that is more event-like, where in fact, you don't actually need to look at the entire history of the data that you're dealing with, but you're only interested in computing information over particular time frames. So you might want a, a running average of some particular value uh, over the last 10 minutes. And again, um, a SQL database is not probably the right mechanism for doing this. Another thing that um, makes it viable for using an Entity Framework is if the data can be partitioned into reasonably independent groups that have high kind of internal cohesion um, and where the size of the data what you're dealing with, again, is small to medium. Again, if you're, if you're a Google-style enterprise and the volume of data that you're dealing with is just enormous, um, it's probably the case that something like SQL Server um, may not be the easiest tool to use in that circumstance. So here's an example to help us uh, look at what it means for uh, data to be tightly coupled or to require cohesion. Um, now, you'll notice my examples kind of come out again of my current work environments. I, I help build or I build or company builds a uh, learning management system, and that learning management system is concerned with exactly the types of data that we see here. You know, we've got instructors and students and courses and exams and that type of thing. And so uh, these are some of the types of things that, that we see when we're building this out. So we might have an object um, called a course, and it has a list of instructors associated with it, and a list of students who are taking that course, and a list of exam definitions that are the exams that students need to take when they're in this course, and a list of exam results, which are actually the results of students taking those exams in the context of that course. Um, an exam definition, well, it points back, you'll see it has this belongs to field, it points back to the course that it's associated with, and it's made up of a list of questions. And then we can go look and see that an exam result um, has a reference back to a student, well, the person who took this exam, um, a pointer back to the course that it belongs to, uh, a pointer to the exam definition from which the questions were derived that were presented to the student so that they could answer them, a list of answers which contains that student's answer. So one of the things to notice about this set of object definitions is it's highly referential. Every object ends up pointing to or having lists of other objects that make up its state. Um, and what makes it tightly coupled is in some sense the assumption that all of these things have to be consistent with one another. Um, that is, when I go and look at a course and look at its list of students, I expect to find you know, a set of students there. And if I look at a set of exam results, I expect that those exam results correspond exactly to that set of students. And if those two things were to get out of sync with one another, my software would be unhappy. It would actually say, wait a sec, there's something wrong here because I've got an exam result from a student who isn't listed as being associated with this course. And the software, the code, would actually treat that as an error. 
And that's what makes the system tightly coupled are these assumptions about how um, data relates to one another, about making these assertions about, well, the set of exam results must precisely match up with this set of students. And that's where this notion of eventual consistency comes in. Eventual consistency does not map well onto a tightly coupled system like this because it allows uh, the data to be somewhat out of date. So you might actually have a situation there where you had an exam result uh, for a student who wasn't listed in the course. So this is an example of what a, a tightly coupled data set looks like. Here is an example of a data set that is more loosely coupled. So I've got a user, and then I've got this auditing information. So the idea here is that I am, I have this object that I'm interested in. It's a definition of a user. And it's going to change over time. So a user might come in and change their name. And every year, their age is going to get you know, one larger. And I want a way to track those changes over time. I need to know how those things were changed historically. So I've got this auditing structure attached to it. So a user audit um, has a, a key, which is an ID. You can see that. It has uh, an audited ID, which is also a good. Now, interestingly, this refers back to the user object. The difference from the free previous slide is, in the previous slide, if I'd wanted to represent this as a tightly coupled entity, I would have declared this as being of type user. I would have said, I actually have the user that this belongs to. What I've chosen to do instead is basically include the key of the user uh, in, instead of the whole user object itself. And then I finally, I've got this list of state changes associated with it. So every time a user makes a change to themselves, or every time the user object is changed, we create a new one of these state records. And we say uh, you know, when it was changed and what the new values were that were applied to the object at that particular point in time. Now, what's interesting about this, there's a comment here that says not a foreign key, by which I mean um, this is not a foreign key as maintained in the database. The idea here is that, let's, let's suppose at some point in the future, the user object gets deleted. Um, that doesn't cause the user audit to be invalid. So we'll come in here and we'll look at a user audit, and it will have a GUID, GUID for its audited user that it corresponds to. And we might say to ourselves, OK, I'm going to look that user up and discover that, oh, that user doesn't exist anymore. They, they've obviously been deleted. And the software, unlike in the previous instance where that inconsistency was regarded as being an error, in this situation, it's not regarded as being an error. It's regarded as being a reasonably natural state of the data. And so this system is more loosely coupled because it is prepared for there to be some inconsistency between the different sources of data that it's manipulating. Um, and I think, as I say, that this is probably the key point in whether Entity Framework and SQL Server are going to be appropriate mechanisms to build your software out of is how tightly coupled does it need to be? Uh, and in some cases, this will be forced on you. If you are using a lot of third-party web services to do things, or if you have structured your application as a, a very disparate set of services, then obviously, you are typically going to have this kind of reference where what you've got inside the data you're dealing with is a reference to a value that's held in another service. And when you need to get that object, you're going to have to make some explicit call to retrieve its value. And you're going to have to be prepared to deal with the fact that when you make that call, you might get back an answer that you, that you weren't expecting. Whereas in the previous case, the object values were essentially completely in line, and we made these assumptions that if there was an inconsistency, it was an error in the code. So the last thing that I think um, marks whether Entity Framework is a viable uh, tool to use is this kind of time to market consideration. And this is something, again, based on my own personal experience. Um, if you have data in your application, if you're manipulating data, which is almost every application is going to be, you're going to have some kind of data access layer. And what I have found in the various applications that I have developed over time is that we have tended to build up uh, a layer of infrastructure that starts to look like an object relational manager 
because we need its capabilities. We need that ability to pull information into the database, represent it as object. We need to deal um, with querying things. We need to deal uh, with navigation between objects, following, basically following along pointers or reference from one object to another. And if it turns out that the requirements of your application are going to have you essentially construct an ORM yourself, you're probably better off using one that already exists. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a pure kind of software uh, design issue that you sit down and you say, well, what does it look like we're going to build? And if you, if you see that there is going to be a significant amount of highly relational data where there's a lot of tight coupling between things, then in order to build the data access layer yourself, you'd probably end up constructing something that had some similarities to Entity Framework. And so being able to simply pull one of these things off the shelf is likely to save you time. And so the things that are going to matter here is, you know, what's the complexity of the data you're dealing with? What kind of functions do you need for pulling uh, in, and pushing information back and forth between the database? You have to look at what the learning curve for the framework is. Uh, and you have to worry about whether that framework is going to cause you correctness or performance issues. Because basically, all frameworks hide things. Right? They, they, they construct a layer that makes it a little bit harder to a lot harder for you to see what's going on under the covers. And that can be a problem uh, when you're trying to get an application out the door. Uh, the last thing that people often talk about um, when asking the question, should I use Entity Framework uh, to do, uh, to build a particular application is, is EF scalable? You know, because that's a, a concern for anybody building an application. I mean, am I going to be able to scale this out uh, to larger size? The answer for EF, or I think, is, well, sort of. Um, you can build a, a big system um, out of smaller pieces, but you wouldn't normally define it as a single unified um, entity framework model. You definitely want to be able to uh, break your application into smaller collections of tightly cohesive data, um, but then have a series of services that are more loosely coupled with one another. I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on this because I want to get actually to some of the interesting pieces with Entity Framework itself, but there are real uh, serious uh, limitations about what, what can be achieved when you start to have multiple services interacting with one another, particularly in environments where um, the network can be partitioned so that your services can no longer uh, talk to one another. So one of the most interesting things here is a thing called the CAP theorem, which limits um, what you can achieve with respect to three properties. So CAP stands for consistency, availability, and partitions. And it basically tells you that in a distributed system, there are three things that you generally care about. Is my data consistent? Is my data available? And what happens when the network gets partitioned? Or how tolerant is the system of the network being partitioned? And like the typical engineering joke, um, the CAP theorem says you can choose two of these three things. You cannot have all three of them together. And that limits uh, what you can achieve when you're building out a large application like this. So I, if you haven't heard of the CAP theorem, I would suggest that you uh, make use of that digital library that Eric mentioned and, and have a look at Eric Brewer's paper where he talks about this because it's a very interesting fundamental limitation on um, the way that you build distributed systems and what can be achieved in, uh, in uh, distributed systems. Uh, one of the things that comes out of this is you have to carefully choose where you want to deal with inconsistency is what I say. Because inconsistency is hard to deal with. When you're coding, it's easier to code if the data meets a certain set of uh, criteria, assertions that you can make about it. Like I said before with the, the student result or the list of students and the list of exam results, if I can make the assumption that those are consistent, my code is easier to deal with. So inconsistency is more work. Every time you have potential inconsistencies in the system, you're going to have to write code to deal with that. So you want to choose carefully where you allow that inconsistency to exist. Um, and one of the ways that you can do that is uh, through uh, sharding, this notion of uh, breaking your database up again into uh, services that may be differentiated from one another based on 
the location where the customer is going to access them from, where the client is going to ask them from. If you're building a multi-tenanted application, you may be able to break your data down into groups based on who the customer is actually. And, and in some sense, you know, how's one set of customers in one service and another set of customers in another service. And finally, you can have function-based sharding, which is the idea that there are particular services within your application that are broken out as independent service. And you can combine these, of course. You could break your application into three fundamentally different um, and uh, loosely coupled services. And then within those services, you could use customer sharding to further break things down based on the set of customers. Finally, um, it's often the case that, of course, you're dealing with uh, content. We, we, for example, in our application deal with a lot of content. We have course content, all the uh, PowerPoint presentations and videos that people have to watch. Um, and it's, um, generally speaking, it's appropriate for that kind of content to be living in a content distribution network where it's essentially read-only um, and one is often not too concerned about um, having immediate updates of that. So if the, if the content of a course changes, it may be okay that um, some person is looking at a slightly out of date version of it for an hour or two or something like that as the CDN updates. So generally speaking, um, I would say that Entity Framework is a reasonably good fit with enterprise application. What's an enterprise application? Well, kind of pointing back to the things I was talking about previously, I think of enterprise applications as having rich data structure. They've got all of these different types of objects that you're manipulating, and these objects tend to have these relatively tight relationships. Furthermore, um, it's often the case that an enterprise application has more limited scaling requirements. Enterprise applications are going to be used by enterprises. Um, and rather than a, a consumer application, you know, it's not Facebook. Facebook has a, a billion users. If you look, for example, at the application that I build, the marine learning system, um, a customer, uh, a large customer for us might have 100,000 customers. And many of our customers have our uh, users. Uh, many of our customers have a much smaller set of users, uh, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 to 10,000. So we have more limited scaling requirements than if we were building an application that was going to be consumer facing. So that's what I mean by an enterprise application. And I do think that in many cases, inter uh, Entity Framework is a, is a good match for this. Um, and just to sort of reiterate in the previous slide there, once you, you know, identified that any framework is likely to be a reasonable thing for you to use, then you want to look at uh, dividing your system up into a set of reasonably independent services where you're dividing objects based on their kind of relationship cohesive. So you want to build those services, and then you potentially want to look at using some types of sharding in order to be able to uh, scale those things out. Okay, so now we're going to dive into some of the details of Entity Framework. Um, we're going to talk about uh, building a data access layer on top of Entity Framework, because Entity Framework by itself is not actually a, a data access layer. It's a framework that provides you, I think, the capability to create one. And then we want to look at some of the common performance issues that we run into in Entity Framework. And this latter part is actually a significant amount of the pain that people usually experience with object relational managers. Again, object relational managers create this layer between you and the database, uh, and it is uh, quite common that that layer introduces performance problems. And it's certainly the case that we have encountered a number in building things out with Entity Framework, and so I wanted to cover off some of the ones that we had run into. So what does a data access layer look like? Uh, well, for me, I think it really has got kind of uh, these uh, three uh, first bullet points. We need a unit of work abstraction. What's a unit of work? Well, it's basically uh, like a database transaction. It's a, a way of grouping together a bunch of code so that it all happens inside one transaction as far as the database is concerned. From the point of view of the software writer, for the guy who's writing the code, Transactions are really nice because they give you this universe in which everything is consistent, where you can look at your data, follow your relationships, and you won't run into any surprises. Uh, and so it's a, it's a nice environment to write code in. You pay a price for it. 
transactions are somewhat expensive. They are particularly expensive if you try to run them uh, across multiple machines. So again, the idea here is don't do that. Try and create um, services where you can have your unit of work confined to a single database on a single machine uh, so that you don't run into those kind of uh, performance issues. So the unit work transaction, an environment in which it's nice to write code because that you've got a nice consistent picture of the universe to work with. Uh, on top of that, you need a repository abstraction. Uh, a repository abstraction is basically a way of um, getting, it really is in some sense, it's the fundamental data access component. It's like, it's a way of saying, okay, there's a set of users. I need to be able to get sets of users. I need to be able to reach in and pull out a particular user or sets of users based on some particular condition. Um, you need a mechanism as I just suggested, and that to, to query things. And in Entity Framework, the query language that we use for doing this is LINK, Language Integrated Query. LINK is one of the absolute most wonderful parts of Entity Framework because it is an extremely powerful tool for being able to uh, pull information back from the database. Um, one of the nicest things about LINK, well, there's two nice things about LINK. One, it provides a set of operators that are reasonably intuitive for most programmers to use. Um, the second is that it's type safe. It works in the context of, of, uh, of C-sharp types. So unlike often when you're speaking directly to the database where you just get back the raw data out of the rows and columns, in LINK, you just naturally get back to typed objects. Um, the last thing I want to talk about there is just briefly um, mention uh, a limitation, what I think of as a limitation between Entity Framework and uh, Dependency Injection, which is another tool that developers frequently use. So what's this data access layer look like? Well, it looks like this. Uh, usually you have some kind of thing called a unit of works. I've got it called a UOW here. And the way you write code is like this. You have a using block, you declare yourself a new unit of work, and then inside that, you manipulate objects that have been retrieved from the database. Um, in this case, it's a read-only transaction. So what it's saying is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull back some objects from the database, but I'm not actually gonna make any changes to them. You could also have a write uh, unit of work, in which case you're going to pull back objects from the database, you're gonna make some changes, and then at the end of that unit of work, you are going to commit it, just like you would commit a transaction to the database, and that will now transactionally store that information back into the database. So you've got your ACID proper properties from the database, basically, that it's atomic, that it's consistent, that it's independent, and that it's durable. And that's what that unit of work is buying you in the context of working with objects. A repository is, as I said, basically a way of getting access to one type of objects. So the way that this typically would work is once you've got your unit of work abstraction, then that unit of work is going to provide you access to the repositories that you're going to use to pull the information out of the database. So here we're going to get a repository of users. Well, the repository represents all of the users that are stored in the database. So I come to the user repository and I say, it's got an all property on it here. So the all property is going to return what in any framework we refer to as a queryable that represents all of the objects in the database. And then we're actually going to start querying. We're going to start narrowing down what it is that we want to do. So first or default is a link operator that allows me to pull information back from the database. And what information am I going to pull back here? Well, I'm going to pull back the first user record that I can find in the database where the name field on that user is equal to Terry. And this is what I mean about uh, intuitive mechanisms for being able to pull information back from the database, is that most programmers find this as a very straightforward uh, way of being able to locate information in the database and start to manipulate it. Um, and it's also, interestingly, reasonably efficient. So you might look at that all um, method in there and say, oh my god, it's going to look at or pull back all of the information or all the users from the database. Well, it doesn't. What actually happens here is that it issues a very straightforward SQL query to the underlying database looking exactly for those rows in the database that match this criteria. And only those users are going to be pulled back from the database. So it, it can, it's easy to understand, but at the same time, it can be performant as well. 
Um, once I've tried to pull back that user from the database, well, I'll have to actually check and see whether they were there. So if it turns out that my user was null, then I didn't find one of those. I didn't find anything in the database that matched that criteria. And obviously, I'm going to have to have some code that deals with that situation. Otherwise, I've actually got a value for my user, and it's a nice looking object. And so I, I just start using it. I can look at its properties. I can look at its field. It can have methods on it. I can call methods on it to carry out particular sorts of operations. So as I said before, one of the nicest things about Entity Framework is the fact that it uses link for uh, its querying mechanism. Um, and there's no way I can cover everything about link in, in this talk, but I do have to say that every programmer that I've met who's used link has come away from the experience very happy. It is, it, in my experience, it is a tool that developers absolutely love. Um, and the reasons for that are primarily it's type safe and composable in a performant way. So let's look at this. Um, I've written a method here, and it returns a queryable of user objects. Um, and what it says it's going to do is it's going to return the active users to me. So it's going to go in, and uh, it's going to get the user repository, which is going to get off the unit of work, et cetera. I haven't put all that code in there. But it's going to say, I just want to get all. And then it's going to say, OK, I want to filter that. So I'm going to put a where clause off where I only pull off the users who have the active flag set. Now, so the first thing to notice again, we've called this all method, which is getting, in some sense, theoretically or whatever, it's talking about all of the users that are in the database. Yeah, but we don't that. have to. Sorry? I thought there might have been a question there, but I'll just I'll keep going and, and let it, Eric interrupt if uh, if there is a question. No, no, um, I'm sorry, I was interrupted here, so uh, my apologies. <laughs> not a problem. So the if the fact that we're referring to all of the objects or all of the users in the database at this point is not a performance concern because it's not actually going to pull them back. And even when I execute this where clause here, or where I push this where clause on and say I want to filter that, it's not actually going to query the objects back from the database there. What, we're, what we are effectively doing here is building up a query that will be executed at some point in the future. And that's what this queryable uh, result type from this method means. It means what I'm returning back here is not actually a real set of users. It's effectively a query that needs to be materialized at some point in the future. And the nice thing about that is it then becomes composable. I can have another method where I call the active users method, and I get back this set of active users. And I could add a further filtering condition on that. And this is what I mean by composable. I've got this queryable that's come back from active users, and I can simply add more information onto that. And again, this is, this is not being applied um, iteratively in the database. It's not as if we made a query for the active users and then down here um, took that set and further filtered it down. What we're really doing, again, is building up this, this one single query that will be sent to the database just once and return us back exactly the set of active users whose age is, is less than 10. So there's this materialization process that you have to be aware of in uh, entity framework, which is the moment where the queryable turns into effectively a list. Um, and that's, of course, one of the ways that you can cause a query to be materialized in entity framework is by using the to list operator. So if somebody gives you a, um, a queryable, you can apply the to list method to it, and now it will actually be executed in the database. And you will actually get back a real set of uh, users. But the super nice thing is that you can now build up methods of queries that are composable with one another. And I don't think that I've seen a system as nice as this in any of the other um, object relational managers that I have worked with. So this is one of the nicest points of Entity Framework, and it's, in some sense it's actually not a property of Entity Framework per se, but a property of link being used in the context of Entity Framework. Um, I, I'm going to uh, skip over this fairly quickly. Um, I can answer some other questions about this in detail to help people. Like, but, uh, Fundamentally, Entity Framework doesn't like interfaces. Um, 
In NAD framework, objects that are mapped to the DB via a concrete class, um, and when you pull them back, you get them as instances of concrete classes. Um, although you can cast them up to an interface type, um, this causes issues. Um, it, it makes it difficult to manipulate them. Uh, so if you're using dependency injection and you like interfaces, you'll find that this is a little bit um, uh, challenging in the context of, of entity framework. Um, there are some ways, as I say, to deal with this, uh, particularly with respect to dependency injection. Um, the fundamental database context in entity framework has an object materialized handler that you can use. Um, and basically, this handler gets called every time Entity Framework reads an object out of the database, and it provides you an opportunity to basically inject additional information into the object at that point in time. Um, another interesting thing that we've run into in using Entity Framework ourselves is when you have a unit of work that needs to query for objects that may have been modified elsewhere in the unit of work. This happens when you start to get um, layers of software where you have, uh, uh, you start a unit of work and you call a method on some object and it calls a method on another object. And finally, several layers down that stack, you have somebody making a, uh, trying to query for objects that meet a particular set of criteria where some of those objects may have been modified already in the context of the unit of work. Normally, if you make a query in any new framework, it's always going to go back to the database to pull that out. And so uh, if you have a modified object in memory, you may not find that based on that. Um, and we have come up with a technique for working around this um, that allows you to make sure that you always capture the correct state of the objects within um, the, the transaction effectively. It's a very complicated uh, looking piece of work. I'm going to very quickly go over it because I wanted to have enough time to talk about uh, some of the performance stuff uh, or associated with NAD framework. Um, this one is a piece of code for finding a single object of a given type, given that you've got a predicate um, that you uh, are using for doing that filtering operation. Um, and you'll notice it has a fascinating type, that the type of things that the predicate is given to it, not as a lambda, but is, is declared as an expression, basically, of a lambda type, an expression of a func which takes uh, type T as an argument and returns a Boolean. Um, and the reason for this is uh, related to the way that any framework itself actually works, where um, the predicates that are passed into an entity framework actually need to be expressions uh, because entity framework needs to look at the structure of those queries in order to be able to translate them into uh, to SQL. So basically what we do in this hunk of code here is um, we use some entity framework primitives uh, to ask entity framework uh, to find all of the entities that are in this unit of work that have been added or modified or are not changed. Uh, and then we use a compiled version of this predicate to then ask whether that object uh, exists. So we'll, we'll ask, we'll say, is the, uh, is, the, is the object that matches the predicate in the set of objects that have been added inside this unit of work? And if we find it, we say, okay, we're done. And then we look for uh, the object in the set of ones where it's been modified. And if we find it, we're done. And then finally, we ask if it's actually in the database. We end up making a, we finally do at the end of this, end up making a query down to the database for looking for this stuff. But this allows us to um, correctly retrieve an object based on a given predicate, even if that object has been modified somewhere else uh, in the unit of work. Okay, so what kind of performance issues does one run into with any Frank? Well, Again, there are lots of uh, things that you will run into. Um, the, uh, the ones that most commonly have come up for us have to do with uh, what is called change tracking in Entity Framework, um, and also uh, a series of ones having to do with basically trying to pull bulk data sets out of uh, Entity Framework for reporting. Uh, change tracking is particularly important for performance issues related to inserting data into the database. And uh, so I have to describe briefly what change tracking is, uh, how Entity Framework handles it, and then how you can uh, make the performance better for that. So what is change tracking? Um, well, change tracking is uh, a fundamental piece of Entity Framework that 
is required because Entity Framework has to know which objects are going to write back, it needs to write back into the database. So if, again, if you imagine the typical way that you're using this is you start a unit of work, you pull some objects in from the database, you modify some of those objects, and then you commit the transaction, you commit the unit of work at the end of that. Well, Entity Framework has to figure out which of those objects have changed because those are the ones that it needs to issue update statements to push data back into the database. And Entity Framework has two ways of doing this. Um, one of them is through a mechanism that the Entity Framework folks refer to as auto-detect changes, and the other one is through a mechanism called um, change tracking proxies. So change tracking with auto-detect changes, it, what it essentially means is that there are certain Entity Framework um, methods or calls which cause Entity Framework to literally go through all of the objects in the transaction and see if they've changed. So it, just, it, li it literally linearly steps its way through and it looks at the first object and says, has this one changed? And then the second one, has this one changed? If you have a unit of work that doesn't deal with many objects, this is not a problem. If you have a unit of work that is dealing with hundreds or thousands of objects, this can be very problematic. It can be really problematic in particular if you end up um, pulling objects in to the unit of work one at a time and then making a, an entity framework call that results in it looking for changes. Because what happens is you pull in the first object and entity framework checks for changes and you pull in the second object and entity framework checks for changes on the first object and the second object. And you pull in the next ob object and entity framework makes a check, on check for changes on the first object and the second object and the third object. And if you're familiar with this, what you get is ON squared performance um, for all of those objects that you're pulling into memory. This happens for us in our application, for example, when we do a bulk import, we have a way of representing courses and exams and all of that um, as an externalized XML file. And we read that in, and we basically, in the context of a single unit of work, build up the internal memory data structure of this. Well, we, in this circumstance, can easily pull in tens of thousands of objects into a single unit of work as we parse them out of the XML and basically create the corresponding objects. Uh, and this turns out to be really, really incredibly slow. Um, an alternate mechanism that any framework has for doing change tracking is uh, via proxies. So what happens here is you define an object that Entity Framework is going to map back and forth between the database, but Entity Framework itself builds a proxy object that essentially lives in front of that. So whenever you get one of these objects back from Entity Framework, you're not actually looking at your class that you defined. You're looking at a proxy object that looks exactly like your object, but allows Entity Framework to capture um, any changes that are being made. In particular, any properties that you access are going to go through that proxy. And so Entity Framework can now know when changes are happening via those. So it will go, if you change the name field on a user object, for example, then that's going to go through the proxy and Entity Framework is going to go, oh, you've changed the name field on this object, therefore this object is modified. Um, so there's these two really separate mechanisms for doing change uh, detection in Entity Framework, and the question is, um, which one of these is better? Well, fundamentally it depends on whether you touch a lot of objects uh, inside your unit of work over and over again. So if you have a, a, a small number of objects but you keep touching many of their fields, it may be that the change tracking proc proxy is more expensive because you pay a cost on every field access. On the other hand, if you're pulling in a huge number of objects and not uh, touching uh, them many times frequently inside of that, then as noted above here, you'll get this ON squared performance from change tracking. In our particular application, we have found it desirable to uh, turn off auto-detect changes completely, which is a simple property on the DV context. Just go into the DV context and literally set auto-detect changes off. Um, and we have certainly found uh, for our application on the whole that improves uh, performance substantially. And I do mean substantially. Literally, you are talking um, two to three orders of magnitude of speed difference are possible when you're dealing with large numbers of objects. Um, an interesting thing that we've observed 
uh, on a performance front for Entity Framework as well is that it makes a difference how you assign relational properties to objects. So there's two possibilities for this in Entity Framework. One is you can directly assign to um, the object valued version of that property. So for example, if I've got a user object and it has a, a pointer, a reference to another object which is its owner, um, I can directly assign that. I can say user.owner is equal to me. Another possibility in any entity framework is that I can do this by assigning the foreign key because whenever there's an object relationship like this, at the database level, that's reflected through a foreign key um, constraint between the two. And so it's also possible in any framework that you could say user.ownerID equals me.ID, so actually connect the keys to one another. If you're using change tracking proxies, then the assignment through the foreign key um, automatically updates the corresponding object valued field. So Entity Framework is smart enough to see, oh, he's changing the foreign key. I need to update the object field to be consistent with that. And what's interesting in our experience is that assigning through the foreign key uh, is much faster than assigning the navigational property. So we're kind of surprised by this. They seem like they should be equivalent to one another, um, but our experience is that they're not. And then in fact, you get about an order of magnitude speed difference for assigning via the foreign key. Okay, got a tiny bit of time left here. Um, uh, and I know not leaving much time for questions, unfortunately, but uh, maybe we'll sort of bleed over the hour slightly for that. Um, in performance issues in Entity Framework, the other big area that we've run into them is when you are trying to pull back bulk data sets. And the reason that you're typically doing this is for reporting. You want to run a report, so you need to, uh, you know, again, pull back a whole bunch of rows of data that you're going to display to the user and say, you know, here's the information that you're looking for. Uh, and the issues that we've run into when doing uh, this kind of uh, bulk pulling of data from the database are materialization costs. So literally, the amount of time that it takes for Entity Framework to build the in-memory representation of an object when it pulls it back from the database. Uh, another one that we have run into is, um, we obviously have, as I, uh, through the example that I uh, provided much earlier in the thing, we have these deeply nested data structures where object A refers to object B, which refers to object C, which refers to object D. And in our reporting, we basically need to pull information from each one of those levels. In fact, often what we're doing is aggregating um, values from sub-object types. So if I have an object A which contains a bunch of object Bs, then one of the things that I want to do is often compute an average of a property of the B field for a particular A object, and then I want to do that over and over again. I'm going to have a report that's going to list all of the A objects and all of these aggregates across different levels. So we tend to get these deeply nested data structure with aggregates. And the queries that Entity Framework issues for these in many circumstances are deeply, deeply nested sets of joins, um, which SQL Server has difficulty processing efficiently. So there's some interesting tricks that one can perform to um, uh, resolve that. And finally, the last thing is that we got into certain situations where the only way that we have been able to improve the performances of our reporting is basically to have either views at the SQL level or caches built at the Entity Framework level that in some sense look like views. Um, and the reason for this is that uh, if you're familiar with SQL Server, you'll know that there are a variety of um, oper SQL operations that you cannot perform inside a SQL view, such as aggregation. You cannot use aggregation operators. And so what we've ended up doing is essentially building these views ourselves, but doing it using Entity Framework. So here's an example of uh, this kind of uh, deeply nesting, uh, sorry, this is an example of materialization here, uh, where um, you want to be very careful, again, about where you force Entity Framework to actually issue the query to the database. So what I'm trying to do here is, is compute some grades for some students. So I'm going to assume um, that I've got a list of students somehow. I've got a queryable for this. And it's pretty natural for programmers to write the following kind of thing. They say, well, if I want to do a report, and it's across all of these students, and you've given me a queryable for the students that you want that report on, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop over them. I'm going to loop over those students, and then for each one of them, I'm going to say, okay, find the exam results for that student, 
compute the average of the taking uh, a sum of all the answers that they have given, so basically what the student scored on each question, and divide that by the sum of the max score for each one of those questions. So again, if I've got two questions here, one has value 5, one has value 10, then on the bottom I'm summing up 5 and 10, and on the top I'm summing up the scores that the student had, and the result of this is I get their average on that particular exam, and that's what that average operator is. So this looks pretty natural. And then at the bottom of this, I'm going to say, okay, I want to order by the grades. Um, then I'm going to skip the first 50. I'm going to take the next 25, and I'm going to convert that into a dictionary so that I can kind of print that information out onto the screen. This is a typical reporting kind of thing. It's because the user is looking at a paged version of this report. So in this case, we're assuming that there are 25 entries per page. And so what, what we're doing here with the skip 50, take 25 is this is really, this is the third page of the report. We've skipped the first two pages. We're getting to the third page. So if you've ever done any reporting using Entity Framework, you end up with stuff like this. Obviously, the numbers 50 and 25 are hard coded in here and would normally be based on the paging parameters instead, but just to give you an idea. Now, the problem with this is that this looping structure has forced all of the data into memory at the point that the loop is done. And now when I do this ordering by grades and skipping and taking, this is all happening in memory. So what I have done through this code is I have pulled all of these students into memory, even though it turns out I'm not actually going to need all of them. The only ones that I need are for the third page of the report, but unfortunately I have materialized all of them by the way that I've constructed this code. Now, this looks fairly similar to the last code, but it doesn't suffer from a materialization problem. And what I've done here is just used more of the capabilities of link to avoid forcing that materialization to happen. So I take the set of students, and now I use the select operator instead to basically pull the data back. The nice thing about the select operator is, like everything else in Link, it doesn't materialize the query. It just updates the query that's going to be sent to the database. And what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, for each one of those students, I'm going to construct a new anonymous object. That new anonymous object is going to be composed of basically the things that I wanted in my dictionary. I got a student, and I've got their grade. I compute the grade in exactly the same way. So this portion of the computation looks exactly the same as the, as the previous page. But what I get back here now is a queryable, i.e. something that has not actually been materialized from the database yet. Now, I can do an order by skip take, and all of these operations are going to be now pushed down into the database as well. Um, and this to dictionary at the very end is actually what causes the query to be materialized. And if you look at what happens down in SQL Server is now the order by the skip and the take are all happening down in the database, and I only materialize the 25 student results that I need to see for this particular page of the report. So I'm going to stop at this point because I want to try and leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, there are some, a few more slides at the end which will be available, I presume, as part of the recording. And as I say, um, I'll be happy to answer questions uh, uh, asynchronously via email about some of those other slides as well. So back to you, Eric. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, there we go. I kind of advanced you here. Oh, uh, I advanced too far. There we go. Questions? So um, thank you, first of all, very much, Terry, for your um, uh, presentation. Um, and I will, let's uh, do a few questions. We did get uh, some, so I'll... Uh, Ask them to you, so and I'll pick just a few because, as you said, given the time, we cannot handle all of them. So the first one is, which non-relational data provider is available for EF? Or is it only for SQL? So we use a tool, I think, uh, from a company called... Oh, it's got rhinos in the name. Um, I will have to look it up. Uh, it, I, it is actually uh, an incredibly useful tool. So it's called the EF Profiler. I think it's from a company called Hibernating Rhinos because they started out in uh, doing tools for Hibernate. Uh, but it basically provides a, uh, a debugging tool that connects the precise lines of code 
with the exact queries that are being issued by um, Entity Framework at that point in time. Uh, and it provides timing information. So it actually tells you how much time the database query took, um, how much time was spent in object materialization. It's incredibly useful. If you're going to use Entity Framework, you probably want to have it. All right. I don't think that, that was useful information, but that was not the question. The question was, okay. is there, are there providers for NoSQL databases? Ah, I guess I, I have not had a huge amount of experience with this. I do know that there is a link provider for RavenDB, but because I've never used it, I really don't know anything other th more than that it exists. Okay, then the next question is, um, what do you call a big system? Is that like, you know, t one table, 10 tables, 100 tables, 1,000 tables, 10,000 tables? Um, that's kind of one dimension, and then you know how many, how much data, like you know, one k or ten terabytes. Right. Uh, I I don't think that the tables are so much an issue here. I mean, I would I would love to see a system that actually had ten thousand tables because that implies ten thousand different types of objects, and my I can't wrap my brain around that. Um, well, that's so, the JDK or the .NET based uh, library, so. <laughs> Okay, anyway, I mean, it's a, um, that is outside of the realm of my experience, I guess. Um, I, you know, in, in all of the systems that I have built, um, we have ended up with something on the order of, you know, 50 to 100 tables at, at most. Um, so anything outside of that scope is, is beyond my experience. Um, in terms of the size of the data sets, um, again, you have, to, you have to start off by assuming that, that you're going to partition the data set in, in some way. So um, what we're not talking about here is it's not the full size of the data set that matters. It's the size of the data set that you have decided has tight coupling associated with it and therefore that you're going to implement in the context of entity framework that's then wrapped in a service. Um, inside that, I mean, I again have certainly had experience with um, SQL Server databases having, you know, uh, tens of millions of entries without any performance issues being associated with that. I've certainly read about people having billions of rows in SQL Server databases and being able to effectively use those. Um, so again, I, I don't have a vast amount of experience on this. I've built a number of applications and uh, can tell you that entity framework has fit nicely uh, within, the, within the bounds of uh, those types of amounts of data that one is dealing with. But again, it's very important to realize if you've got a very large data set, if you've got terabytes of data, it is unlikely you are going to wrap that in a single service based off entity framework. You need to look for a way to decompose that data into um, smaller units of cohesive data. All right, thank you. So the next questions I'll combine to is how do you deal with the triggers and stored procedures? <laughs> we avoided them like the plague. Um, so it, it is interesting. I, I guess one of the things that I should say about the development that, again, I have typically done is that we always work from what any framework refers to as a code first basis. We write the code first and the database essentially comes out of the bottom of that. Um, I know a lot of people who if you have an existing database that you basically have to layer entity framework on top of, that's a, a more challenging problem because you've got this existing structure that you have to deal with. Entity framework has the capability to deal with stored procedures, so you can essentially access the stored procedures and have the information that comes back be represented naturally within your system as a type set of objects. So there's a, a, a way to integrate those. Triggers I've had no experience with at all, and again, we just avoid like the plague because of the complexities that it would cause for the application to use them. All right, and the other question in this kind of uh, realm is, um, how do you deal with transactions and consistency and things like that? But, so as I said before, um, we have a unit of work uh, as part of the fundamental data access layer that represents uh, a transaction. So you open a unit of work, you manipulate objects, and, and that is a transaction, literally a transaction. We use um, uh, the snapshot uh, consistency in um, 
SQL Server uh, as the way of actually implementation for this. Um, Entity Framework uh, is basically designed to work uh, with optimistic concurrency control in the database. So that means that snapshot mode of doing things. Um, again, you want to avoid um, having, database, or having transactions that span multiple databases like the plague. You basically don't want to do that. If you, for any reason, um, have the, uh, the transaction method, the distributed transaction coordinator required for your application, I think you're probably already in, in deep water. You don't want to do that. Your application should run without the distributed transaction coordinator coming into existence. And if it needs to come into existence, something has probably gone wrong somewhere as far as I'm concerned. Uh, because the moment you have that, you have two-phase commits. The moment you have two-phase commits, you have issues with respect to partitioning, you have issues with respect to speed, um, and it's just going to cause you pain. The moment you have that, what, if you are in that situation, what you have to do again is say, how can I decompose my data into smaller services where the amount of cohesive data is a reasonable size for Entity Framework to deal with? All right, uh, the other question is like, um, how well does Link map to SQL? So in particular, can you access all of SQL via link? Um, I think the answer to that is no. I am not a SQL wizard, so I don't often feel the compulsion to try and uh, get uh, an example. I think that I, I, uh, I'm aware of where you can't access functionality is SQL Server has a mechanism for querying hierarchical data structures. Um, and as far as I know, there's no link mechanism that allows you to generate queries that take advantage uh, of that. Um, generally speaking, um, my usage of SQL is somewhat simplistic. So, you know, the operators that I care about being able to access um, are indeed um, available from link. You know, being able to, to join, being able to group by, being able to perform aggregates, um, performing takes and skips. I mean, those are the, the sort of the fundamental operations that one needs to be able to carry out. As I mentioned in one of my slides, an issue with Entity Framework is that if you write queries in probably what I would consider to be the most intuitive fashion, it is likely that you are going to get very deeply nested uh, query structures. You're going to get either um, layers and layers of inner joins or more likely cross apply. So Entity Framework tends to generate a lot of cross apply and outer apply um, in terms of the way that it generates queries. Um, I had a slide for this which we didn't have a chance to look at, but um, if you get into that situation, if you find that your queries are becoming too deeply nested, you basically have to hold Entity Framework by the hand and you have to say explicitly, I want you to join this table with this table with this table with this table and then group these things in this way and then pull your data sets out. And the result of that very explicit query will be significantly less deeply nested than, again, perhaps the more intuitive query. So you're bumping up against the bounds of where that intuitive capability of link um, and performance considerations bump into one another. All right, so then um, there are um, a lot of people kind of report small typos in your uh, example code, so uh, we should thank them for that and you should fix it. Um, and then okay. given, the, yeah, but given the, well, you probably didn't execute it, Terry. I think they came from oh. Dev Studio, so they compiled, but I mean, I had to twiddle with them when I copy pasted them, so. All right, I'm just uh, teasing you. Um, so the last question, since we're running out of time, is uh, how do you see the future of EF? And uh, are there any kind of features that you would like to see? Or you know, is it kind of done? Or yeah, what, what is your vision about that? Um, I don't know that I have much of a vision. I mean, I would love to hear what the Entity Framework people say. What I do know is, uh, you know, just and this is just from reading the Entity Framework blog, is that um, the Entity Framework folks are busy working on version 7 of uh, Entity Framework. So the current version right now, I think, is 6.1.1, and they are busily working on version 7. The most interesting thing about version 7 is um, that the team's stated goal is to build the best ORM possible. And What's interesting about that is that's not historically, I think, been the goal of what Entity Framework was. Entity Framework was part of a much more significant data modeling project at um, Microsoft that spanned 
more than just SQL Server and more than just any framework. It was part of a larger um, collection of attempts to create a unified data modeling environment. And a lot of the uh, baggage that came along with that um, has, is going to be dropped um, in version 7. So they've basically, I think, I, I would say, this is how I interpret what they're saying, they've abandoned that baggage of that, that giant data modeling universe and said, we're just going to focus on making Entity Framework the best ORM that it can. And I think that that's great, because that data modeling universe is something I've never made use of and never felt any compulsion to make use of, whereas I really have found Entity Framework to be something that helps me to deliver better code faster and get it out the door so that I have ha happy customers. All right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid uh, we're out of time today. Um, thanks again, uh, Terry, for your informative presentation and your answers to the questions. And um, a special thanks to everybody um, that uh, participated today. And make sure that you um, Fill in the survey if you have a chance. And again, the webinar has been recorded and will be available online uh, in a few days at learning.acm.org slash webinar. Um, there you can also find announcements on other upcoming webinars and uh, other ACM uh, activities. So thank you and goodbye for now. Take care, uh, happy holidays, and uh, see, uh, maybe uh, see you another time. Thank you, bye-bye.